might be something you want to say. Yeah. Like what? I mean, why would I want to say something so I could watch you sneer at me? Sneer at you? I don't ever sneer at you. Oh, sweetie, you don't have to. You get your point across. Okay, so fine. Then say what you want to say then. Peter. I don't want to say anything. I've tried saying it. Okay, so try again. Release yourself. Oh, release you, you mean? Yeah, fine. Release me. Just say it. Just f***ing say it. Don't you swear at me, you little shit. Don't you ever raise your voice at me. I am your mother. Do you understand? All I do is worry and slave and defend you. And all I get back is that face on your face. So full of disdain and resentment and always so annoyed. Well, now your sister is dead. And I know you miss her. And I know it was an accident. And I know you're in pain. And I wish I could take that away for you. I wish I could shield you from the knowledge that you did what you did. But your sister is dead. She is gone forever. And what a waste. If it could have maybe brought us together or something. If you could have just said, I'm sorry, or faced up to what happened. Maybe then we could do something with this. But you can't take responsibility for anything. So now I can't accept. And I can't forgive. Because nobody admits anything they've done. The only thing we have to fear is fear itself. No. Be afraid. Be very afraid. There's nothing to fear except God. Whatever that means to you. Do I look like someone who cares what God thinks? <laughs> You're listening to a podcast exploring faith and fear, what scares us and what saves us. This is the fear of God. Hello and welcome to another episode of the Fear of God podcast, your favorite podcast, my favorite podcast, everyone's favorite podcast. Here at the Fear of God, we find the holy and the horrific at the intersection of faith and fear, dissecting what scares us in order to find what saves us. We are so glad you're here. Speaking to you right now is one of your co-hosts, Nathan Rouse. Now, typically with me is fellow co-host Reed Lackey, but He had to head out to the store for some balsa wood, and I really, frankly, didn't even know Reed, you know, needed balsa wood for anything in particular. But hey, you know, we we all have our little hobbies, um, and who knows, maybe he'll inform a little bit when he gets back. In the meantime, I wanted to encourage, request, entreat, implore, uh, request? Did I already say request? I can't remember. There's a lot of synonyms there. Um, that you, dear listener, go to iTunes and leave a rating, leave a review, subscribe. We would love to have you do that for us. It would just really mean a lot. Um, and in the, well, read, read your, you look white as a sheet, buddy. You okay? Ooh. Oh my God. It's like I've, I've been doing something like that for like a year and a half and in context, here it finally is. Come home to roost. And I, I really my to my tongue is tired. <laughs> I don't think I've ever made that statement anywhere about anything. My, that my, statement, yeah, that my tongue is tired. Oh, oh, oh. Well, you know, I don't know. I don't know. Yes, uh, it's, it's it's an odd statement. It actually it's an odd like, you do it six or seven times in a row, and it hurts a little bit. Sure, so, sure. Yeah. So that was it. Leave, it was unwise. We're on gonna my leave. Part. We're gonna we're gonna leave all of that alone. <laughs> Um, I mean, so there's <laughs> We're just too gonna, much. Yep. No, nope. Nope. We're going to push, push right push, past that. Hey, Reed, right guess what? It. You and I have yeah. not talked. You, we, we haven't, we haven't looked at each other in a while. <laughs> yeah. Um, lis- listeners won't know that it's been maybe, gosh, maybe a month. Almost a I month. Little, I was a little yeah. rusty there at the beginning. Um, <laughs> since we have, since we have recorded, but did you know, you and I haven't talked about this. What? Reed. What? It's a, it's our third anniversary. Is it? Oh my this gosh! Month. Oh my August. gosh! I cannot believe this. August That's of 2016, crazy. 
was when we first debuted. Yes, this is our third anniversary. Oh my gosh, third time's the charm. That's fantastic. And I can't believe it. We've been doing it so long now that we've stopped counting anniversaries. Not that we, you know, like here we are no, talking I, about it, but it's no, like... I, I'm counting the anniversary. I'm, I'm telling you, I know, it is but the it's, anniversary. But the, I remember the counting when the, has happened. <laughs> but I remember, like when the second one came up, it was like, oh man, this is. Uh, I mean, I think it was on my mind for like four months beforehand, and now it's like snuck well, I can't, up on. I us. can't help that I'm the only one invested here. You know, <laughs> like it would, it would mean a lot if you would just kind of pull your weight. Yes. And <laughs> can you play along with oh, us, wait. please? Yes. I'm sorry, I didn't realize your mic was still on or my mic was still. On. I'm just kidding. Uh, happy third anniversary, Reed. <laughs> happy third anniversary. This is. Pretty Three crazy. years. We've come a long way. Oh, my we're, gosh. We're a lot different podcasters now than we were three years ago. Yeah, you listen to episodes like in the very beginning, and it, everything sounds <laughs> very different. We're always I love, more I love, I love, and by love, I mean I really hate. Uh, every now and then, I'll, I don't know why, I'll go check out the first one <laughs> just like for, for like two minutes. Yeah, do that. And it's like, <laughs> it's like hi, hi, this is Nathan, first time <laughs> caller. Um... <laughs> I've never done a podcast before. I'm very self conscious. Sound like a group therapy session. My my boisterousness, uh, you know. Yeah. It was under wrap it was under wraps for an episode or two there. That's but true. then I was like, ah, who cares? <laughs> just go for, go it. for it. As Let your it all hang out. Rows. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Now Dude, I am very super exciting. Now I'm super comfortable. <laughs> Almost a little too comfortable. If, In case <laughs> <laughs> listeners want to know the truth. <laughs> Sometimes I miss that reserved Nathan who won't just no, you jump don't. In. No, you don't. No, oh you don't. Um, so it is our third anniversary. I did want to also just like thank not just Jeff Hansen for hosting, but Ian Olson, Andy Whitfield, Blake Collier, you, my friend. What a great yeah. quarterly king we had last week. That, that was, was really something special. I'm very, very uh, thrilled and delighted that that was that that was able to take place, the context of the weekend, the context of the conversation, um, just super, super encouraging. Uh, and when I listened back onto it, uh, it brought back a flood of memories and it still gives me a tremendous amount to reflect on and be encouraged by. And yes, I, I'm super, super grateful for that conversation and for that time. Okay, so not all, speaking of time, not only uh, is it our third anniversary, but we are doing our first major contest, Nathan. It we've has been, been a major contest. It, it's, it's like it's the biggest it, one that we've ever done. I don't. It's think like we've... on a Christmas story. It's like a major award. You know, it's a major <laughs> it's contest. A major award. It's we the... are. We. I know. We mentioned we we're going to do a, a, a voodoo gift thing. Uh, it's really just a leg lamp. Uh, uh, you know, send like, them. We send them. A Honestly, some of our <laughs> listeners might prefer that to, to, to the gift card. Like, I want this leg lamp. Their spouses, however, <laughs> <laughs> like, how did it break? It was all the right. way over there. <laughs> so, okay, so we have got we have been pushing throughout uh, the series Funny or Die, which preceded the aforementioned Quarterly King that we just aired. Um, we have been pushing this contest. Um, for where somebody, some lucky winner, is going to win a one hundred dollar credit towards uh, Vudu, V U D U, the service, uh, the streaming service online and digital library. So, uh, Nathan, read. You want to exciting? You want you want to find a winner? Yeah. You want to find a winner Wait, right I, now? I mean, I want to alert a winner, and we'll figure out who the winner is. I think we okay. have a little a little guest. Yes. To to help us determine a winner. As a matter of fact, yes. Hey, buddy. Hello. Uh, listeners, we have one Mr., uh, well, my son. Say hi, everybody. Hello. <laughs> so he's going to draw uh, the name. I know you can't see this right now, but we have a hat filled with names. It's Dr. Riedenstein's signature hat. <laughs> so, okay. Let's, uh, yeah, papers are shuffling. Papers are shuffling. All right, son. Pull a name out of the hat and read the name. Who wins the one hundred dollar gift card? Whoa, whoa! I feel like we need to do a drum roll. Oh my gosh, who is it? Okay, okay, okay. Okay, all right. Who is it? Matthew White Chocolate McDougal. <laughs> oh! <laughs> White why. chocolate. Matthew Matt. White. Good chocolate job. Good job, McDougal. buddy. He he worked for that one. He sure did. All right, say bye, everybody. Hello. <laughs> and say congratulations to Matthew. Congratulations, Matthew White Chocolate. Yay, what 
Duh. <laughs> I, 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 I that's, forgot. I forgot. Well, that's how I, I felt. I that's how I felt. Yes, exactly. That's that's the yeah, way yeah, I yeah. felt. Yes. <laughs> we'll get that to you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, buddy. Well, we're going to get back to the show, okay? Say bye, everybody. So, bye, Lou. while our guest exits stage right, uh, Matt, so congratulations. Um, you, you well earned that voodoo credit. So uh, we will reach out to you and figure out how to get that to you and then you will have to share all the things you spent this credit on with the facebook group so we can all drool over your selections and say oh we're gonna have movie night at white chocolate's house (laughs) and what we're gonna have is white chocolate covered pretzels with matt and his family (laughs) i was just trying to to think of something oh all of that all of that white chocolate themed sure so yay congratulations congratulations matthew that is uh very very exciting and thank you to everybody who participated yes there will be uh, a second and a third place to be announced stay tuned to the instagram feeds and we will be drawing names for winners of a uh, the prototype Fear of God t-shirt with the Fear of God logo on the front. Um, so stay tuned to the Instagram feeds if you entered and did not win. Um, stay tuned there to for your chance at one of those t-shirts. So this was very exciting. I'm very, 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 exciting. very, very happy for everything. That's that's really exciting. I know it's not a, a leg lamp, but hopefully <laughs> the voodoo credit will be appreciated. Um, that said, Reed, I know our... Our guest just left, but if you want to get him back in, I'm just curious. What is watching? <laughs> what is reading? <laughs> what you listening to? Well, in I, the meantime, since he's not here, I guess sure. I guess you'll do. Oh, I suppose. Wow, that's <laughs> tone and timber of our friendship. I guess I guess you'll do. I guess. <laughs> I guess, uh, I guess that's it. Yeah. Um, oh, well, he is, I mean, he is actually at present. He, you know, he jettisoned the the room where we're recording, and he's watching Skylanders from Netflix. So, uh, yes, that's that's, oh. that's what he's watching right now. Yeah. So, um, so yeah. So, don't know a thing about it. So, um, what I've been specifically reading because I th- some shade was thrown at me for you know we don't read enough here on this show so uh I think I shade was thrown at us there was no <laughs> unique shade given solely to you no lampshade um leg lampshade so <laughs> wow but basically um i read i've been meaning to for a while and i'd never gotten around to it i read uh the book harry potter and the cursed child it's actually a play oh. um that was written by uh jack thorne john tiffany and of course J.K. Rowling, who had come up with the story. So um, I had... I love I love that you're, hey, I know I haven't been reading, so what I read is a screenplay, which That's takes, a... like, you know, 30 minutes to read. It's a stage <laughs> play, thank you very much, but yes. Oh, you know what I'm talking about. You know what's come crazy? On. If you go what's to crazy? see the... We haven't seen the show yet. We've been looking at tickets right. for the possibility or whatever, but if you go to see it, it's in two parts. Like, you have to... To see the story... Yeah. You have to go to two nights of the... Well, have you seen it, Mr. Nathan? Mr. I know all of it. Have you been no, to the theater? No, but I've read it, and I've read it. It's on my shelf. I read it oh. when it came out. Nice. Uh, and oh, yes, I have Harry investigated... <laughs> maybe a little bit, but... Um, <laughs> um, but no, we have pondered, is there a way to make it happen? It, 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 who knows if yeah. or when that will, but nonetheless, yeah, yes, course. it is in two parts. I'm sorry for derailing. Please continue. No, 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 it's fine. Um, so, but yeah, I was I was very taken with it. I love. Uh, it's got the true to form plot twists and surprises and special appearances. I did love. Uh, I want to be careful here because there are probably readers who are fans of the uh, movies or of those books and have not read this yet. There are definitely some surprises uh, in the realm of cameos appearances uh characters who you would not expect to be in this story are in this story and i was really thrilled and excited by some of the pivots um i thought it was a very exciting story i will say that while the ultimate resolution to the story was quite satisfying i was a bit let down by just the final like scene or two it felt a bit just anticlimactic, like after everything we'd been through but it was a really thrilling read i felt like it was a, a you're a really a, thrilling read Thank you. Um, I feel like the experience of of getting to reacquaint with those characters was really fun, and uh, yeah, it, it it only emboldened my desire to want to make it out to the theater and actually see the show at some point if we can make that happen. Yeah, I don't, I don't totally disagree with you that the reading of it was, a, and 
as it should be. It is a stage play. Like you're you're only experiencing half of it in just reading it. Right. Uh, right. But I, I I would be curious to see it translated on stage because where I was going there is I I kind of agree with you that even narratively I was like oh okay whatever right you know it's right it's, right right it it doesn't it doesn't on the page feel as fundamentally necessary to the mythos as perhaps the experience of seeing it right on the stage i am dying to know how they perform some of the magic tricks because there are some things on there the like that i'm like i mean I, I i wonder if it would be you know just basically the audience is going along with the uh idea that polyjuice potion is turning one character into another or is it uh, that do they somehow transform using two different actors? And, and anyway, I, I'm very curious to see how they would, you know, execute the spells and some of the set pieces coming to life and stuff. I'm like, man, I don't know how in the world do they do this on stage? So, would be very interested to see some of that. Well, you're a wizard, lackey. <laughs> right. right. That's how. That's how they do it. Um. <laughs> so I've got. A pair of watches. I'm gonna rattle at you. Do and, it. Do it. Um, uh, one of mine is also a book. Look at us. Look uh, at us. I mean, mine is mine's an actual book. Like, like mine was an actual. It took I held it up. Time. I, I read it. <laughs> there were Although truth, truthfully, in, I, I suppose truthfully, in comparing the two, you you read a book that happened to be shrift in in, in words. Uh, right. I read a, a Kindle file. Like a, a digital yeah. file, yeah. That happen to have a lot of words attached. Who to cares it. more um, about literacy now, Rouse? Burr, 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 burr. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> never mind. <laughs> um, so the first one, <laughs> the first one is a movie, and it's relevant to where we're going. So I did go see the new Ari Aster film, Midsummer. Ooh, I haven't Ooh. seen it yet. Yeah, I haven't seen it. Um, m- m- spoiler alert: a little bit like the film we're going to get to today, I wonder if I will appreciate it more for a repeat viewing. Okay. Um, and if you've seen a trailer, this uh, 10 second spoiler for Midsommar here, but read you, you're a smart savvy movie mm. watcher. And so this would not be really spoiler for you, but there's no, you don't watch it and are surprised by the ending. Like it's gotcha. You know, yeah. If, yeah. Yeah. If you if you've danced around the Maypole in the Wicker Man, you know where this story is going. It very much from the trailer looked like it was going to be like a like an updated sort of take on the Wicker Man idea, if you will. Yeah, and that's not that's not far off. Yeah. Um, that said, he's such an incredible filmmaker that I think if I rewatched it, I'd be able to appreciate more of the craft <clears throat> and less be kind of like down on the story aspect. That said, it Understood. is pretty harrowing. It is pretty mm. harrowing, much like the film today. But mm. uh, the, the book I read, um, I had picked it up, uh, and by picked it up, I suppose I mean downloaded. Okay, mm-hmm. okay. Mm-hmm. Let's. <laughs> 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 um, so I did read uh, Richard Rohr's most recent book called "The Universal Christ," mm. and man, I don't know, like. I'm almost tempted to ask you to read it, like request you read it. Um, okay. Because it's pretty big. <laughs> okay, sure, sure. Um, the, idea, the ideas in it are pretty sweeping. Um, mm. And he's just such a fascinating thinker. And the, the, ba- the loose premise of it uh, is the... Christ essence is personified in Jesus, but is itself an essence that uh, at risk of misstating his thesis here, because I finished it about a week ago and and I would need to remold the notes to to kind of articulate this really well. Sure. He, he kind of builds on this notion of like, we've hung our hat so explicitly on purely the death of Jesus and, and resurrection at the exclusion of thousands and thousands and thousands and thousands of years of history of, of just humanity and, mm. and the, the cosmos. And right, so his notion, right. the, uni- the universal Christ is this kind of bigger kind of sweeping narrative about the good essence of the Christ mystery, as he calls it, as mm. 
visible and personified in the person of Jesus. Gotcha. Is, that's, gotcha. That's a decent. That's a decent distillation. Sure. Sure. Um, but like I said, I, I would be curious as my friend you to kind of get your eyes on it and maybe chew on it with you a little bit. Sure. Yeah, that'd be kind of, that'd be kind of a cool little book club, little little pod, Aww, pod book club. Little pod book club. Um, I would love that idea. There is a podcast that he did with a couple of members of the community where he yeah. lives. Um, the podcast is called Another Name for Everything. Yeah, now, yeah. I, did you listen to it? I did. I'm not caught up with it, but I heard about five or six episodes of it. So I know some of the themes that the book okay. would be yeah, yeah, yeah. kind of yeah. playing around with. Uh, but I intentionally, yeah. I intentionally, I'm sorry to cut you off. I intentionally withheld listening to it because I knew it tracked more or less yes. the themes and chapters of the book. Understood. So that's cool. Yeah. That's cool. So yeah, so that that's uh, definitely something that I would want to check out. Uh, yeah. What did you? I mean, to uh, to your recollection, did you enjoy or kind of appreciate some of what you were hearing? Yeah, and and obviously in the context of a conversation, he he verbalizes some things and then occasionally has the opportunity to unpack in depth the ideas that he's playing with. So I wonder if I, it'll just be curious to hear once I finally read the book. Uh, whether or not the hearing those ideas articulated beforehand primed me properly for the book, right, or if right. the experience would have been better in reverse, reading the book and then charting through some seeing of the, the movie. Thing. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, basically. <laughs> um, so, uh, so yeah, I, I will uh, as soon as possible get my hands on that and and report back to you once I've had the opportunity cool. to dive in. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, I, I may traverse forward into the podcast too, and maybe that's. I mean, I want you to read the book if you want to read the book, but I didn't realize that, A, you were aware of, or B, that you'd been listening to the podcast. So that's kind of cool and, and more or less does uh, what I would have envisioned for a conversation. So maybe maybe, maybe we'll reference that on a future watcher. Maybe. 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 But hey, Reed. Hey. You hey, know what? Hey, what? It's been like a month since we recorded. And you, do you know... Oh you my know what has, There's a lot of things that have happened in this month. No kidding. Um, like a lot. Like it feels <laughs> pretty. <laughs> it's pretty crazy. I mean, goodness gracious! It's summertime. Kids are out of school. Life is crazy. It's bonkers. There's media here and there. Mm -hmm. So, in the thick of all of the things, a mm. little, a little, a little bit of media kind of yeah. squeaked out into the air. It, it did. did, and it it you know like a like a like a shopping mall in the 80s <laughs> kind of dominated our weekend early oh gosh. in July. And Reed, my dear friend, I want to, at least for the next two to five minutes, <laughs> talk, a, talk about Stranger Things 3 and not just oh talk about Stranger Things, Reed, but revel in the enjoyment. Yes, oh. the pure, unadulterated entertainment i drew from watching stranger things three read it's out we've both watched it yes absolutely this is the it's funny because stranger things uh i think particularly season two somewhat lives in infamy and fear of god lore um and we definitely covered you know prior to our tv guideposts format we covered Stranger Things, uh, we covered TV in general in a very different way. We spent, you know, just hours and hours discussing season in a, you know, singular conversation. And I do feel like watching Stranger Things 3, uh, first of all, they were, they were absolutely brilliant to release it on July 4th weekend, on a holiday weekend. That was a brilliant, uh, it was brilliant timing on their part because I know a ton of people who just binged watched the whole thing over their long holiday weekend. And uh, I was in that crew. I think we finished it all uh, in about three days. It's only eight episodes, but we finished it all in two or three days. And I think it's the best season. I think it is the best in terms of pacing. I think it's the best in terms of stakes. I think it's the best in terms of uh, performances, even. I mean, I really think they uh, either took the feedback from some of the criticisms against season two and, you know, pivoted away from them in a very deliberate way, or they just simply felt a lot more confident going into the season with the story that they wanted to tell. Whatever the factors were, um, it really landed very firmly in a love for me. I, I thought it was absolutely uh, glorious and fantastic, and I'm very, very excited and hopeful for what a season four might bring with some of what they developed in season three. This is purely conjecture, but I think that 
well, this I think is fact, and then I'll get to the conjecture. I'm pretty sure they filmed two rather swiftly after one. And the conjecture mm. part is, I wonder if just the rush aspect um, kind of gotcha crunched them into, I, I mean, it's, it's, uh, no secret to our listeners of, of almost any length of time that I'm not a fan of season two. And in fact, season three almost painted an even starker picture of like, yeah, I just really don't have much positive about season two to say, because yeah. I think season one is so strong. There are glimmers of enjoyment I took from season two, but season three just did not feel like it retreaded in the way that some of season two and much of season two felt like, and, and you know, even just ignoring my sort of feelings about two, just that pure entertainment. I mean, like, yeah, there, yeah. there was such a just fun aspect to it. Uh, I'm with you, maybe even decoupling it or uncoupling it from Halloween. I don't know, just mm. something about the, the the vibe of it. And dude, dude, come on. The never, <laughs> the, ne- the never ending story. Turn what around. an amazing Oh an my amazing gosh. final button to that season. It was oh. funny because I did have a bit of a like a, a I feel bad for people who did not grow up in the 80s with the never ending story for trying to understand that moment because for anybody who did I feel like that moment is pure glory. It is so wonderfully built to and executed and it's phenomenal and it, it's it's like addictive to rewatch it. I think I've rewatched that clip <laughs> of just cuz uh, it, it cutting to there's so many things going on to it. It cutting to each of the different people that can hear its reactions oh, yeah. it's and great. then the reactions of Dustin and Susie where they're just like and Susie's like raising her arm and she's all, she's all excited yes. into it. It's oh my gosh, it is. Well, and wonderful. and the power of that is like and I I don't I don't I don't think season three is a perfect piece of media. It's just a hell of a lot of fun. Mm. But that uh, with a lot of strengths to it, I, I didn't mean that to be a backhanded sort of compliment. But sure. um, that particular moment is maybe the finest payoff they've ever delivered on the show. I, like, yeah, I agree. I agree. <laughs> and, and not just for fun's sake, even though it is that, but just a connective moment that ties the entire series kind of arcs and stories and characters into one that if you weren't paying attention or had just forgotten, you know, Susie was just not, it was just a thing in season, episode one and then that's it. Yeah. To just have that moment be her payoff was great. Oh, it was anyway. Fantastic. So yeah, yeah. Stranger Things three. It's full, wonderful. Full hearted, wholehearted endorsement from all of the fear of God hosts. Absolutely. No, it's, it's absolutely fantastic. And uh, that has been yet another edition of, what you watching? What you listening to? to what you what reading? You reading? What, what you listening to? Make believe I'm everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> we just keep going with it. It just, it just doesn't yeah. stop. Five minutes later. Oh, it's awesome. It's awesome. Hereditary. <laughs> Ew. <laughs> now, now, now we're getting dark. Now it's just now it's yeah. just going wrong. It's just going wrong. Um, All right, Reed. Here we are. So, uh, yeah. Speaking of hereditary. Uh, so, what we decided to do? We've got a couple of upcoming seasons uh, series that we are pretty thrilled about and pretty excited for. Um, but when we mapped out the upcoming three or four series that we're looking at, um, it left a pocket of like three weeks here where we, um, you know, just had to decide what to put in. So we decided since uh, we had taken January off, which, uh, spoiler alert, might might become a little bit of a thing. We'll see how things go. Um, but we had taken January off, and in that interim, that is where we normally would have uh, covered some favorite films, horror films, from 2018. And so, as a result, uh, we didn't get the chance to talk about a few films that we had been pretty excited about, and, and beyond that, just some some films that were much talked about by many of our listeners and many of comparative media. So, this 
brief little series, a three-week series, is an opportunity for us to do just that. Um, and so it's a chance for us to dive into some of uh, the most talked about and a couple of our favorite horror films from 2018. Um, and so we're, uh, I and don't this know. One, this was your absolute favorite of 2018, wasn't it? No. I'm just kidding. No, I, don't, I, don't, I was I'm like, just, no, just no, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> um, although we will be covering in this series my absolute, not only favorite horror film, but favorite film of 2018. So, um, but uh, yeah, so Hereditary, I don't think there's any doubt in in uh, the sort of uh, critics' minds at large, maybe even audiences' minds at large. This was one of the most talked about, not only horror films, but films of 2018. Uh, it made a bunch of waves and ripple effects in think pieces and uh, dissections online took the horror community by storm. I feel like there were some people who were a bit divided on its impact or its themes or, uh, you know, I mean, it, it definitely generated a tremendous amount of conversation. Um, so we felt particularly, even though I think we would both agree uh, just summarizing. Don't speak for me. Well, fine. Then I disagree I'm with just, me if you don't I'm like just it. Kidding. <laughs> I didn't say I would disagree. I was just saying don't. Yeah. Don't do it. So um, even though I don't think this would land at the very top of the list for either of us in terms of horror films of last year, I definitely it was just too in the zeitgeist for us to not discuss it as part of this series. So we figured we'd just you know kick the door down and dive right in and cluck our tongues and uh, chop off our heads and get right into <laughs> get right into. You're just uh, all the things all, yeah. all the things all the things so um i saw this in the theater you did I as saw well this in the theater as well yeah yeah and then yeah that last 30 minutes it was like you could hear a pin drop in the theater <laughs> oh just like, and I, I saw it alone too i mean the theater had people in it but i didn't go with like a buddy or anything and so i was like i don't know what to do with this i don't know what i was supposed to feel about all of this um it was definitely a pretty harrowing experience did you get to see it with somebody or did you also go alone I, we had a little crew. I, I wow. think there was at least at least three of us, maybe three or four, or something like that. And, some hand holding, you know, some on. some some people whom probably after the fact were like, uh, I don't know why I'm friends with Nathan, um, <laughs> you know, <laughs> for suckering them into going to see this insane movie. Sure. Um, yeah. So I saw it the first time when it was in the theater, and then rewatched it for this episode. And and I think if you're okay with it, we'll save our general feelings until we get a little deeper. Sure. In. Sure. No Did problem. You, I've got a couple of trivial bits. I don't know if you do. I have three or four. Um, so um, okay. yeah, I'll start with one of the lightest ones. Uh, the director Ari Aster, if that's how I say his name, um, he has a voice cameo in it. Do you did you really? catch where this was? No, he is the voice on the answering machine from the gallery that is calling um, Annie to ask uh, about her art gallery date. The one who's very much like. You know, hey, you know, if you if you need to postpone, we can certainly do that. Or if you're not, we need to find out where we are. That's right. the director uh, is that voice. So a little cameo there. It's kind of fun. What do well, you have? Purely, purely um, metric wise, I just saw this a little while ago. They spent 10 million making it and it grossed 79. Oh, my gosh. Uh, which is, wow. Yeah, huge. But I thought <laughs> when you said a little light one here, I thought this is where you were going. I did read today that at a screening in Australia of yes, the movie Peter Rabbit <laughs> in, in yep. 2018, they accidentally showed the hereditary preview yes. on the front of Peter Rabbit. And the theater was apparently full of families, including at least 40 children, which is hysterical. <laughs> that's awful. Oh my God. Oh man. Yeah. That's rough. That's terrible. One of the things that I found out it, it, uh, it takes, uh, there's, there's a tremendous amount of inspiration from various horror films throughout the generations, but it takes its primary inspiration structurally from two types of films. Number one would be like, um, family dramas, uh, like ordinary people, the ice storm in the bedroom, but then also horror films, uh, many of them specifically about trauma, like Rosemary's baby, don't look now, the innocence, um, um, and I do think there's a gravity to focusing on both of those things being based on character more than plot. And I think that the film, uh, again, saving most of my general feelings, I think the film is stronger for having that focal point. One of the things that I did find really, really funny, and then I'll see if you have any, any more to share. Tony Collette had told her agent, 
uh, right before signing on to do this that she only wanted to do comedies and lighthearted films because she wow. she did not want to keep doing heavy material and she as a person actively dislikes horror films but she signed up for this because she said the script was so impressive she couldn't not do it um, and then she later praised the director she said he was the most prepared director that she had ever worked with um, wow so, yeah take yeah. that take that Shyamalan <laughs> Right. Like, uh-oh. <laughs> so, uh, um, do you have anything? Yeah, else? I, I don't. I don't have any other specific trivial bits. I've do got you? one last one. Uh, yeah. Just I, I thought, and this, if you haven't seen this film, uh, this is a little bit of a sort of a spoiler for where this is going. But when the director was pitching the film to various places, he frequently described it as a story about a long-lived possession ritual told from the perspective of the sacrificial lamb, which I thought was very interesting. And wow. And, it is accurate to to what you're what you're seeing, though you may not know it. Out the I do gate. love I do love that in our exchange of trivial bits here that the only one I really had was the one featuring traumatized children. Um, you know, <laughs> right. like I don't know. I guess I'm just a good American these days. But... Oh, whoa, whoa, whoa. oh whoa. my god! Whoa. <laughs> Welcome Reed's back. Reed's gonna Nathan leave Wells. that in. <laughs> um, <laughs> oh. Try um yeah yeah i did that Mm -hmm. um so yeah so do you feel good about kind of jumping into things yeah let's dive right right let's um let's head on over to hereditary so i will speak generally for my own feelings when i first watched this i was super taken with which sounds real macabre but I was so invested in the kind of family horror aspect. Like, mm. like I, I thought it was a, just a really interesting story that then sideswiped me with a demon possession at the end. And it, right, and, right. And just bat insanity. Sure. Um, yeah. To the point that I would have said until two days ago. Like, meh, I, we will, let's cover Hereditary because it's a quote unquote important horror film for right, right. A, the re, the recent kind of audience, but I'm not like super thrilled. And I've got to confess much, well, I won't confess Stranger Things 2 is good, but I will, <laughs> um, that, th- that three is, and thus the property can, can keep moving. <laughs> I, they, they now have my approval, right? That's how it goes. That's all um, we're waiting for. That's all. Right, right, right. Okay. Whew, the duffers are just like breathing a sigh of relief listening <laughs> to this episode. Um, but knowing, uh, and and this, I, I, I'll asterisk this with my, I referenced Midsommar earlier. Like, it is kind of heartening, and I'm, this is going to sound, it's so hard to rewatch stuff in the life I currently live. So okay. That, yeah. Yeah. You know, like it's, it's, the, you know, to rewatch a film really feels like a tall order unless it's uniquely and specifically for a, a purpose. Um, but I do have to just give props here to Ari Aster, who I'm pretty, I think wrote, I'm pretty sure wrote. He wrote directed. it. Yeah. It's an original screenplay and, and he directed it. Yeah. And it's his first feature, by the way. Um, yeah. Yep. This it's so artful. And, and I guess where I'm going with this is this is just the nature of good art, which is like you, you, you do a disservice to maybe yourself, but definitely to a piece of work by strongly uh, uh, developing a summary judgment off of one experience because Mm. this most recent viewing for our conversation right now, knowing, okay, this is ultimately a demon possession story. I was much more, it would be, it would be strong to say I like the experience of watching the movie, Mm. but my appreciation for what he does went much higher. I would almost say I was negative after the first one. Gotcha. Uh, okay. Because it's just, it's so heavy. And that pivot, if you're not paying attention is so strong. Like mm. it's, it's a mm-hmm. hard turn uh, into something very, again, if you're not paying attention out of the blue. So knowing it, I just, I don't know. I came away with a sincere uh, appreciation that I did not have going into the second viewing. I can understand that. It was really, and I expected this, but uh, was fully confirmed how 
many times they tell you sometimes yes. bluntly what's going on but you're just your wavelength is not there yet the first time through seeing it um, did you catch did you catch the the heracles quote or the heracles uh, teaching in the classroom uh that conversation rings a bell to me but what what specifically are you referring to well it stood out to me rather rather forcefully so in maybe the first classroom scene of the of peter's right uh class not not of charlie the girl he's interested in raises her hand to answer a question about Heracles. Okay. And I the, remember this. The li- yeah. Her literal quote is Heracles fatal flaw is arrogance because he literally refuses yes. to look at all the signs being handed to him the entire play. Yes. Yes. And I was like, okay, you're good. You got me. You and, got me. You and know. they say, the teacher says in that same moment, he asks a question of the class. He says, is it more or less tragic that he has no choice? It, because that's what they start talking about. They start speculating about like, well, these this is prophesied, and this is the oracle, and and one of the things. Well, that, yes, yes, but what you're what, and uh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off rudely no, there. No. I, I often mean to cut you off, but <laughs> not quite so rudely as I just did. But I think you're identifying a narrative story aspect as we engage with Peter's character, which is correct. I just thought it was this really great kind of meta moment of, hey guys, oh, right, right, this is. It's all right here. Yeah, you know. absolutely. Well, and the treehouse is the very first shot. It's the first image, and that doesn't, you know, it's nothing but set, you know, stage setting uh, when you're watching it the first time. But then it really stuck out to me. I was like, oh yeah, it 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 ends where it begins. Like that treehouse is the focal point. And I, there's also the moment when Annie is in the her first session with like the grief group. And yep. and she s- mentions her brother committing suicide because their mother was trying to quote put people inside him. Oh yeah, and oh yeah, and it's, then it's... I like, and then of course the symbol, the little necklace the grandma's wearing, and it's on the telephone pole, and and the, yeah, there's just so many different things along the way. Did you did it ping for you? It did for me that when Annie is giving the eulogy for her mother. And she says there's a lot of strange new faces at her mother's funeral. And she says at one point that the that her mother would be touched and a little suspicious to see that turnout. But those faces, I would imagine, I mean, I can't confirm it, but I think those faces would have likely been the members of this cult that oh, she was the... absolutely. Know, yeah, and yes. it's just like that never yes. would have pinged me the first time through because you just don't have all the information. You just don't right. know everything that you're dealing with, much like the characters in the film. Right, and I think that was what was so impressive to me is once you, as a viewer, pay attention to the outside looking in... Mm-hmm. As opposed to what the first viewing does, which is just this very intimate family trauma story, right, right? That you then get the wool pulled over your eyes until the end. Like that was what I approached the second viewing as was like, okay, I'm, I know there's a death cult, yeah, and yeah. So let me take note. Yeah, I mean, all the little things that don't register at all the first viewing, other than just as weird. Sure. Even things like you just referenced the 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 uh, um, help group, this um, not self help, but you know the um, yeah the grief share group, grief counseling type yeah. of group. Yeah, I re- I remember watching the film the first time and being like, "Good lord, this is stupid heavy." You know what I mean? Like oh, right, when she's right. rattling off the thing. But if you if instead you're attuned to this, this is the nature of what the the grandmother had been attempting and orchestrating her entire life. Yeah. Oh, you know, yeah. it's, it, it, it totally changes the dynamic of it all. And, and I think that's what I came away and, you know, we can, we can go into explicit, you know, scenes and likes, dislikes. Sure. But that's what yeah. I came away being so impressed with mm-hmm. the craft at work, not just the densely layered script, which that's what I was referring to a minute ago about the artfulness of it. Like you can rewatch this multiple times and keep finding new aspects to it, but just, the the film craft. I don't know if you caught this. The only reason I did is because I did watch it with my headphones that I've referenced before. Probably through half the film, there is this low thrumming, rhythmic, ominous music cue. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That 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 runs through much of it. Oh, and I just love. I, I love stuff like that. 
Sure. There was a lot of, and I, I didn't write anything down from this, but I remember in my rudimentary research, there was a lot of attention paid to the musical score, how much yeah. there would be, how restrained it would be, and when it would not be restrained. And yeah, I think that, that that's all, again, part and parcel to Astor's vision for what he wanted from this film. Uh, the one thing that I found interesting, although I do not know that I would that I would be down for seeing a film this long. Um, uh, the actor who plays Peter, Alex Wolf, said that the original cut was like over three hours long. And wow. that m- most of what was cut were more conversations about the relationships between the family members. And so that was a lot of what they left on the on the cutting room floor because what they left in distilled that pretty effectively. And then it took away from the overall sort of conceit of the final act. And, uh, oh, man, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a fascinating approach to this subject. Um, and it's not completely, you know, we mentioned earlier Rosemary's Baby. There are, there are several films throughout the <laughs> horror genre. You do know that every time you say that phrase, I hear you as Arnold, right? <laughs> Rosemary's Baby. So... Um, <laughs> But uh, there's there have been plenty of horror films that have basically been, oh, we think we're about this, and in the final act, there's a pivot, and oh, no, this has really been going on the whole time. That's certainly not unique to the genre. But I think what sets Hereditary apart is the verisimilitude with which it approaches grief and trauma within the family unit. Like, you know, a huge like for me, uh, possibly even a love, is uh, that it, it seems to take, at least from the perspective of its characters, to take the subject of grief very seriously. Now, I would understand if somebody would challenge that by saying, like, well, yeah, but the third act just throws all that away. I don't know that it does, but I don't think it's deniable that the first two-thirds, at least, handles in a way that feels very honest and feels pretty transparent the the challenges with dealing with tremendous trauma inside of a familial unit. And I think that's what really uh, heightens the film a lot for me. Uh, a lot of it's driven by the script and the the performances. Good Lord, the performances. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, well, I want to I want to talk about that real quick, your, your grief note. Like, it is remarkable to me how much more sympathetic towards the film I was after the second viewing. Mm. And... Um, I'm with you. I would be hesitant to say it throws it away for the third act. Right. It's it fe- the, it feels like there's two things happening. One, it's more that just what you know the sleight of hand finally reveals itself. Like the, right. it all kind of right. coalesces to where it's all been aiming the whole time. But two, something that stood out to me this viewing, and I don't know that this would change much, but I, and maybe I'm incorporating something here that's unrelated to where you were trying to identify, but I remember a criticism that I read just scantly of it about the, the supercharged turn that Annie experiences. Mm -hmm. Um, Like suddenly she goes from the moment with Gabriel Byrne, who lives up to his name. um, (laughs) Wow. To, to then she's like spider Manning around the house um yes but i but i think it's interesting we don't know because the cut there is gabriel Byrne on fire Mm -hmm. and then peter waking up and we don't know what happens between those two we don't know how long she's been off screen doing doing or having done to her whatever is happening sure right right, right, right. anyway i i don't i don't know that that's utterly relevant except to just say it does make sense to, to to hear you say that what got cut out of this film is more just family dynamic because right. I I would I would not agree that it's unclear by the end of the film just how deep their trauma is I could sort of see that there's probably some other character conversations that got omitted yeah it doesn't for me it doesn't hurt the proceedings no I, don't, um, I agree but it would be kind of and but that's that's what my takeaway was the first time around was like, okay, I found the human family drama much more interesting. Yeah. And to the point that when you, when he pulled the rug out from under me, I was like, I, it's more, I hit my butt when I hit the ground and was like, well, doggone it. 
I want yeah. that. Yeah, you know? right, 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 right. Um, Understood. Anyway, anyway. Understood. Um, so a couple, of, a couple of things I'll mention, most, most of them revolving around uh, performance on uh, likes, dislikes. So, well, I'll say this before we get into performance. From the story perspective, I love, love, love that they take Charlie out so early. I love it. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Because it was Because you didn't see that coming. At she's sold, all. She's sold as the... She's on the poster. Yes. She's on the poster. She's all over the trailer. And it was it was very unexpected in a way that I think is... Uh, it really raised the stakes. I thought it was brilliant. I don't know whose decision it was to completely leave her death out of the marketing for the film, but it was brilliant. And what, on top of that, we're talking about like it taking grief seriously. I love... Peter's nearly catatonic reaction to it all because it's, it's so amazing. unique and it feels real in that it is so unexpected. Like her death is unexpected, but then for him to not like just go into a frenzy for him to simply just sort of shut down feels very real. It feels very much like a, like, yeah, this is, this is, um, at least akin to how you can imagine somebody reacting to that degree of trauma coming in so unexpectedly. Like, you just wouldn't know what to do. And well, so you would just do very little. I, I actually have this in one of my scares, is more or less, once Charlie is visibly eating that cake, mm, mm. like, everything for the next 15 minutes of, of film is just terrible. Yeah. It is, yeah. And Peter's when when that moment happens, which was so traumatizing in the theater, you're like, oh yeah. my god. Yeah. Oh yeah. You got you're kidding, right? Oh. Nope. Nope. They're not kidding. But <laughs> the the res that that and this is where I'll just credit Astor's direction here, but he's so good with the camera the camera just holds on Peter's face. Yes. Yeah. And he, cause, yeah. and I think what's so, why that moment is scary as hell watching it is not the resolution of like, Oh, well it's the knowledge. And we watch it happen on his face mm. of, I, I know what has happened. There is zero that can be done. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that is awful. Yeah, it really is. Oh god! And, he, it is. and the and dude, the slow drive away from the scene. Yeah, because there's no need to hurry anymore. Oh my right. god! Oh my god! Yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty brilliant. terrible. It is awful, but it is brilliant. But that then sustains that sequence sustains through Tony Collette screaming, "I just want to die on the floor oh, through the funeral through the fun through the funeral." Where she yeah. doesn't stop screaming for like three shots. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Which oh my god! And I will say, uh, I mean, I'm certainly not the first to say it. She is in this a pure, unfiltered revelation. This is Tony Collette in Hereditary is w not only one of the best performances of 2018. The, it, it's Oscar worthy in and of itself. Of course, she wasn't nominated, but. Not only would I say she was robbed of the Oscar nomination and that it was that it was Oscar worthy, I would pit this against most Oscar winning performances. Sure. I mean, she is a force of nature in this film. The the different layers and beats that she that she is able to emit and the the commitment and the truth and the authenticity that she brings Two moments, like like you just said, and I know that some of this was the intention of the director, but yeah, like screaming through three shots, one where right. she discovers Charlie, the next where it's in the bedroom and, and Gabriel Burns just trying to sort of not even comfort her, but just sort of right. contain the, her. Right, right. And then right into to the funeral. Um, and I love, I mean, not that this was necessarily the intention behind the scene, but... I mean, so we still hear her screams as the camera moves down into the ground. Sure, yeah. And, and it's just, oh, man. Uh, yeah, it, she is stunning in this film, not just for the power with which she can emote in moments like that, but also the tremendous subtlety, the different layers of desperation, the, the layers of skepticism and acceptance that we later see her go through. This is a master class in commitment and performance uh, verisimilitude. It's, it's brilliant. It's utterly well, brilliant. And, and 
yeah, I mean, she deserves all the things that she didn't get, but deserves all of her praise here too and credit. But moments like, like there's, there's screaming, which I'm not taking anything away from her there, but is a dramatic, strong thing to, to, to exhibit. But then there's like, it haunts me the image of her walking into Peter's room and the ghastly face she makes when she's seeing the aunt. Oh, yes. The, that You know what I'm saying? The, oh, the face yeah. where she catches her about to scream because he wakes up, which is all just a dream anyway. Yes, um, yes. I mean, just the visual of her pulling that off expression-wise is just magnificent. No, I but, totally I mean, you know, it's a different performance, but even... You reference his name, Alex Wolf. I mean, he, good lord, he's wonderful. Um, yes. I mean, the the dining room scene. I'm sorry, the dinner scene. Yeah, when they finally oh, absolutely. Kind of come at each other. Oh my god, it's wonderful. It's... And and then no, also, Reed, it's terrible. <laughs> well, it is. It gets, it's, yeah, yes, it was funny it because yeah, what you're seeing is truly horrific. But uh, as a respecter of the commitment and craft of actors pulling this off it's like oh my gosh this is stunning that you're able to do this he the way he sort of steadily devolves into the panic and the and the falling apart the grieving moments yeah they are uh outstanding just absolutely outstanding i will say even though i would just as much praise and laud her for everything she brings to the film uh the first time even in the theater the first time i saw this film Likely because of all of the other things that I've seen her in, I immediately, oh, yeah. I immediately My distrusted. Girl. Yeah, I distrusted Ann Dowd. I knew like she is true. Oh, I she thought is you were problem. gonna sing her praises. I love oh, that woman. But no, she's, that's the thing. She's amazing. Yeah. Oh, she yes. is absolutely yes. amazing. And that's the thing. Like, yeah, I didn't emphasize it enough, but just the yeah. I mean, she brings uh, just a <laughs> truly special quality to everything that she does. But because of the type of roles that she does. Immediately when she shows up on screen, I was like, I I don't trust you. You're doing, right. you're up to something. Uh, but the, yeah, that was all. Well, it reminds me of the, uh, in the infinitesimally small world where this person ever hears our podcast, I apologize to them. But the actor David Morse, you know what I'm talking about? Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I know him. Exactly the same. I don't think he's, I would not categorize him in terms of talent alongside and out, but He's the actor who, anytime I see him in a film, show up. Oh, that's the bad guy. <laughs> that's it. No mystery's over. You know, like nope, he did it. <laughs> that's yeah. <laughs> that's right. um, Case closed. But, go home. Well, I, pivoting back to her, I adore Ann Dowd. I love that woman. She's she brilliant. Was amazing on the leftovers. I mean, I know she's in Handmaid's Tale, and of course she's great there. But just man, that woman knows how to just embody a scene. It's amazing. And I, you're right. Yeah. The, the second you see her, if you know her work, you're mistrustful. And yet, my God, she, she, you know, she lives the moment in this movie. And, and there yeah. are pieces of it where you're like, well, I don't know. <laughs> right. But I, but I love the scene when she, quote unquote, runs into Annie at the grocery store. Oh, man. Oh, yeah. And I don't know if you remember how this is done. But it just stood out to me so much. Like, I, again, my emotional energy around Hereditary is, is not high, but my appreciation for the craft at work is is super high. That scene where she is coaxing Annie to come to the seance, mm. the it ends with her still speaking, but she has backed out of frame. So she's oh, speaking off right. camera right. to... And but again, it's 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 a showcase for Tony Collette in this moment of just all you're seeing is her reaction to what she's being fed. Right. Um, I did I didn't want to get too far from it in terms of just favorite scenes. It's a little sooner than this, but there's such a great single shot. I don't remember exactly where his story is in the moment, but it's definitely after the death of Charlie. Uh, the single shot of Peter biking home. And he drops the bike yes, yes. and the camera pans to reveal Annie in the car, like slumped over. So she won't yes. be seen. Yep. And then him standing at the door, not wanting to go in. And then he goes in and then she drives off. It's just this heartbreaking moment. Yeah. Yeah. No, you're absolutely right. And th- and th- getting back to what we said earlier, those are small touches 
that show that the film, from my perspective, is taking grief and trauma and the complications that ripple out of that, uh, that it's taking them seriously. Because these are the kinds of things that people might do in in these kinds yeah. of situations, uh, but that are so often overlooked for the theatrics uh, of how you normally approach those kinds of subjects. But right. um, as as theatrical as this film is, I feel like when it comes to this family's trauma, it 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 sort of strips away the facade and well, shows us what would really what would really yeah. sort of be there. Well, I was gonna say. Speaking of this family's trauma, I I feel like we just need to pour a cold one out for Steve. Oh um, my god. This poor man. <laughs> he he is just trying to read his paper. He yep. is just yep. trying to pay his mortgage. And yep. he gets caught in this damn demonic wheel of insanity. It's like, crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like you get Gabriel Byrne, and I, I I'm not actually saying they dissed him in terms of not giving him much to work with, but you get Gabriel Byrne and sweet guy. He just, sure. he does it. He, he get he hits his mark. Dinner's ready, baby. Yep. Oh, you, yep. you, Oh, come on now. What'd you do? What's going on in here? Oh, got to go pick the kid up from school. Yep. Oh, I'm just reading, just reading my paper. Oh my God, I'm on fire and I'm dead. You know, it's like, <laughs> well, it's really embodied in the dinner party scene. You or the, not the dinner party, but like the right. dinner scene yeah, you yeah. mentioned earlier when he's just looking back and forth, like a tennis match, like watching the two of them go. And this is, so let me, let it not go unsaid that, um, Gabriel Byrne, there is a, an inherent skill required to, uh, effectively react as opposed to just sure. just yeah, acting, yeah, yeah. and he, uh, you know, skilled veteran that he is, brings it in spades in this performance. But yeah, as far as a character, I could, uh, totally agree with you. I'd be pouring the cold one out as well. <laughs> this poor guy does absolutely nothing but just try to be there for his family, and then even in the moment where he's like, "I'm not doing this with you anymore," she takes the thing in there, and then he's the one that lights on fire. <laughs> He's, he's like, I said I didn't want to do this anymore. He's like, he's he's engulfed in flames and you can't hear him, but he's going, this ain't right. This ain't right. <laughs> this ain't right. Oh, so ain't right. woman, what, you, what did you do to us? Now, I will I will say, as much empathy or sympathy for the, the film as I gained from the second viewing, and I'm not, I'm not um, retreading here, I do think... I, I would be curious to watch, although it'd be retching and, and utterly, you know, probably not valuable to my spirit. But I would, because I am so invested in how well they pull off the family dynamic and the trauma, I would be interested to see a longer version that includes more of that. Because sure, sure. it's so well executed. Yeah, I, I don't disagree. And that's the thing is, like, I'm, I, I don't own a Blu-ray or anything, but I wonder if there would be some additional sort of cutting room floor scenes that would, uh, yeah, just for the sake of seeing what might have been, uh, it, it would be fascinating to, to before see that. We, before we get to scares, I just got to, you know, this movie ends in real insane fashion, but I just, you know, Peter is in the attic. Yeah. And he's just getting assaulted by, uh, by all the things. But I yeah. got to say, Reed, I mean, if I were a teenage boy and saw a bunch of naked old people in my <laughs> attic, I would might I might jump out a window too. You know, There's I'm just gonna yes, say, no question, like, no like, question I mean, about it. Like, you know, your your own body's changing enough, and you're weirded out by it. You see a bunch of old saggy bodies all around you. You're like, I, I'm out of here, man. I am out of here. I don't I'm care how far the, I, don't, I don't care how far the fall it's is. Like, it's like I'm done. This is this is it. <laughs> And what's ironic and about I'm that, out. <laughs> and even though the physical body is still there, that's the last we see of Peter. Yeah. Peter's like, oh, yeah. Yep, I'm oh, yeah. exiting He's the gone. story. Yep. I'm, yep. I'm done. Uh, that is, yes, I don't disagree one iota. Um, I have a list uh, of scares that is like a page long. Yeah, yeah, I know. It's, <laughs> it's, it's, it, this, movie, this, this movie is an exercise in that ain't right. It is like, so an exercise in that ain't right. The, very, the one thing I will say, because... It registered to me in the theater and haunted me for long after I saw it, even the first time. The first shadowy image of Annie's mother, uh, it happens in the first 10 minutes of the film. You remember when oh, she yeah. like yeah. clicks yep. the light out yep. and she looks over and she sees what she, you know, just sort of the vague image? Yep. 
that is so brilliantly lit. It is so brilliantly shot. It's restrained in just the right way, and it oh, it is wonderful. And of course, she clicks the light on, and the figure is gone. But that was genius. That was absolutely genius and terrifying. And good lord, I uh, yeah, scared well, me this, from the this very movie. Beginning. You know, at this point, three years. Hey, it's our third anniversary. Uh, three <laughs> years. Three years into doing this, you know, I'm not really the the novice horror person I once was. Thank you. Um, uh, <laughs> You're welcome. Um, uh, you know, this movie, when when you talk about types of horror film, yeah. or types of convent horror convention, to me at least, this movie is is the go-to for dread. Like, yeah. it is the yeah. definition of what just not... There's one or two jump scares, though not really. Um yeah, but it is yeah. so massively unsettling and unnerving, almost from go, um, that that you're just kind of you. <laughs> by the end of the movie, you want to jump out a window. You're like, I, I, <laughs> yeah. I'm out, I, and I'm done. I'm done. I'm done. I'm yeah. done. I can't. I yeah. can't take anymore. I'm done. Yeah. Um, I have on my next list, or the next on my list is just the shot of Charlie's head after. Bro, uh-huh. yeah. no, no. no. No, that ain't right. That That's ain't awful. Right. That ain't right. Well, again, you know, the 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 layperson not accustomed to horror would be like, "You guys are insane people for watching this movie," um, much less for applauding certain aspects of it. But sure. the brilliance of that moment—it's awful. It's wretched. And like, I'm sad that you brought it up because now it's in my head. But <laughs> is the starkness um, because we know the brilliance of how he does this is. Peter knows empirically what has happened. Right. Right. But of course. we, the audience, don't see for the confirmation. Right. Correct. Then you you walk through his his kind of after effect of this. But even just from a film craft standpoint, everything is dark, and then all of a sudden it's bright light, and you see this decapitated child's head covered in ants. Oh. And it's like yeah. you're I remember that in the theater being like, oh, my God. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. If I'd, if I'd had the phrase at that moment in time, I'd have been like, that ain't right. <laughs> <laughs> it ain't. It ain't, man. Oh, it's awful. God, it's, it's awful. Um, so the next thing I have on my list. Do you uh, remember, um, to cut you off, do, yeah. do you remember, do ants are in the movie a lot? Like it's They it's are. Char- oh, Charlie's yeah. head, the, the, the dream vision. But yeah. also, she sees them in the window. Sill yeah, or yeah, they're they're but moving back and forth. Yeah, is the, do you, to your recollection is the the nature and notion of an ant present in any of the literature, or is it just to, to as you would hmm. assess it, just kind of like a like just a scary image? In other words, like this cult. That's a good thing. question. I don't know. I don't yeah, know uh, that's a good question, but I I don't Thank you. know. No, I I don't know if there would be anything specific to the nature of the ant or the because ants are known as like uh, the, my what are, metaphorical. What are well, my metaphorical connection is as as workers, like they're just workers and mm. strength because they can lift up you spouses know, to uncles. I, I mean, <laughs> I'm just like. Wait a minute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. For a moment, it took me a for a moment we're talking. Said, yeah, for a moment we're talking about like spouses to uncles. You know, uh, I was just talking yes. about the the familial kind. Of course, yeah. of course. Um, but no, I, in terms of like connection to the cult or connection to the death, uh, I I can't immediately find one. Maybe a diligent That's listener fine. would, but but uh, yeah, no, they 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 frequently show up. In fact, it's later in my list, but I wrote down point blank: the ants are crawling all over Peter's face. That ain't right. That ain't, ain't right. right. It ain't right. Well, that whole when when you don't know you're being inceptioned, like she mm. has the she has the vision of Peter in the dream. <laughs> it is awful when even though it's a dream and you don't know it, the confessions she makes to him in the dream. Oh my gosh. It's, yes. It's terrible. I never wanted to be your mother, and then she clasps her hand over her mouth. Oh my gosh! But then it's, says it wasn't my fault. I tried to stop it. How did you try to stop it? I tried to have a miscarriage. Like, oh my god! Like it's oh, it's insane. It's utterly insane. That is what is almost. I, I keep making sideways comments like this because it's a not fully coalesced thought. But 
you could do this film without the demon stuff. And yeah. It is oh, yeah. Ni- it is a nightmare. Oh, absolutely. I mean, just and I know, like you mentioned, I know it's a dream, but verbalizing, I, yeah. I tried to yeah. stop it. Like, yeah. oh my god, like that's a fear that many, many children sometimes have with either a, a towards a father or towards a mother. Uh, but to have it so explicitly verbalized, and again, this is all in her head, culminating, of course, in her like lighting the paint thinner on fire. Again, this is a dream, but I'm just like, oh my lord, it's it's utterly brutal it's just so completely brutal um i want to mention one thing before it it gets away uh even though it was earlier in the film uh the manifestations when she's at joan's house uh the first time you see stuff starting like really to to really get real like the glass sliding and the chalkboard and then her hair flick like those are brilliant those are brilliantly executed scares but then it following Joan's final statement to her, you didn't kill her, Annie. And then, of course, Annie turns around and is like, what? And then she says, she isn't gone. And then that that follows, or immediately following that, she's driving home and in the yes. car. Here's yes. the tongue click. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is... I mean, it's Again, it's like you're talking about, this dread. It is brilliantly executed in that is it is not that interested in startling you so much as in this persistent feeling of discomfort and yeah. and and growing well, and that was, fear that moment you just identified was the one kind of true jump scare for me you know oh even, see, i have another the, one uh, well you you yeah maybe we'll get maybe you're referring to the end but um even in the second viewing that the, the tongue click in the car with her by herself i i jumped oh um, sure sure sure, will sure you remind me uh, is so we didn't even summarize this movie. That's okay. I don't, it's late in the conversation and I don't feel the need to now if people are this far, but I can't recall, are we meant to presume by film's end that physical Charlie herself was already housing Payman or Hmm. she ultimately was going to become the host. Do you, does that make sense? It does make sense, and it is. Uh, this is my lack of knowledge of that sort of mythos, uh, and I don't feel like the film really spells it out for us very explicitly. I think that, if if I understand the question correctly, I think that uh, the character of Payman, they say in the film that he wants a a male body, but Charlie, being a female. I think she was always like that child of Annie and Steve were always supposed to uh, that that child was always supposed to house payment and become payment, if you will. But being that Charlie was born a girl, they needed right. to get a new sort of host for it. Um, getting back to what Annie shares about her mother in why her brother committed suicide right. is that because he's, she's constantly trying to put people inside of him. Um, so again, the film doesn't obviously doesn't spell it out very explicitly, but I think Charlie was always intended to be payment, but the fact that she was born a girl, uh, that they needed to find some other way to sort of embody that. And hence they steal Peter <laughs> as it were. Um, but, uh, yeah, I don't well, know if that is, explicitly addresses what you were um, asking. What really is impressive to me about the movie, and I heard Ari Aster in an interview after Midsommar that praised his use of doing this in Midsommar, and I would say does really well in Hereditary, is the the ability to dole out exposition in organic fashion. Like, oh, yeah. Absolutely. There's a lot there's a lot of stuff handed to you in Hereditary that you don't even totally know is being handed to you in the moment. Right, I exactly. Think I, and I would... I would not contend that if, in fact, Charlie is Payman throughout, that it's a conscious aspect to her being. Mm. It is just interesting to me, because you're absolutely right. I mean, Annie says, I withheld Peter from my mom, and and then I gave her Charlie, Mm -hmm. and all of the, the, the literal and figurative nursing that happened as Charlie was weaned and grown. But right. It stands out to me, and the reason I ask it is in the end, when 
Peter is in the treehouse, Joni and mm-hmm. Dowd refers to the physical form that we know as Peter as Charlie. And right, then right. says payment. And that's that I think that's what birthed that question was are we sort of meant to think that Charlie is just a an infant version of what would become anyway, I don't know. Yeah, I, I agree yeah. with, I agree with you. I don't think it's explicit, but it just stands out to me that we're you know, they are housing this entity in payment, but then I'm sorry, in Peter, but she explicitly refers to Charlie while he's standing there. Anyway. Right. Yeah, no, exactly. And uh, Peter, when he stands up from having jumped out the window, click, clucks his tongue. Oh, sure. You know? and You're right. Yes. yes. So clearly there has been some, you know, like it is, it is Charlie. That's, like, that's payments Avengers assemble, right? <laughs> you know, it's like, it is his call to arms. <laughs> <laughs> basically, basically. No, he, uh, you know, so clearly it is. And, and that's the, sort of uh, where a little bit of my ignorance of of this sort of historical uh, element would, would come into play is that I, I just don't know well, exactly what that's supposed to look like. you know. Yeah, and I, I don't know that I even want to in, indulge that conversation. I just think the movie gives us a lot that we... Yeah. And, 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 and I would argue the movie gives us all we need uh, for the story sure. it's telling. I just am a little confused on that, that specific yeah. point. Yeah, that makes um, sense. I did so, want to throw out a couple of a couple of scares here we haven't quite gotten to yet, but mm-hmm. Ann Dowd's Peter, I expel you. Oh yeah, oh, my which gosh. which at the in the first viewing, yes, was not clear to me that she was talking to Peter to right. expel him. That it's like that she's basically trying to. It, it, you would think initially that she's trying to free Peter, uh, but no, she is not. <laughs> no, she is driving oh. out the consciousness of Peter from the body of peter oh yeah. my gosh that's it's harrowing. so jacked up well his whole explosion oh my gosh mm. it's so terrible yeah when he I, slams his face yeah, on the desk uh, and everything uh, 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 yeah. uh, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. i mean you know we can we can get as specific or broad as we want here but pretty much everything after burn gets burned is just that ain't right like, uh yes. So okay. So I have one thing just because we yeah. have not mentioned it, and then uh, and then I'll, I'll get to this part. So I did say, uh, and I mean this statement: the scene where they conjure Charlie, and then she temporarily possesses Annie. That whole yes. sequence is one of the most brilliantly executed fright scenes I've ever seen in any film, any ever. Wow! Because that whole thing is just it is so setting you up for startles and there are a couple of startles in it but it continues to ratchet further and further up and then when she like the flame ignites and then it goes out and then it lights again and then suddenly uh annie starts talking uh sort of as charlie and right. the the continuing meltdown of peter of like i don't like this make this stop you know and then steve you know poor steve just showing up trying to do what's right um but you know all <laughs> he of pour, the, he poured a cold one out just in his wife's <laughs> face you know like, <laughs> but he did he did he did um but anyway no i just think that scene is one of the most brilliantly executed sort of scares that that i've ever seen but i would uh, uh agree with and uh and uh, exclamate uh that you are uh, the, you are absolutely correct. The last half hour of this film, I wrote that it was just moment after moment of that ain't right. Like it was just one one after the other. I didn't actually even start with with Steve bursting into flames with burn burning. Like I did. I didn't. I wrote the discovery. I put it from the discovery of the headless body in the attic. That from that moment, uh, and then you get Peter's well, freak out. Oh, and from, then you from Annie discovering Grandma. Yeah, from Annie yeah, discovering yeah. Grandma. On through the end of the film, I'm like, nope, 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 that ain't right, 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 that ain't right. I, re- I remember in the theater, once Peter wakes up, sits on the edge of the bed with half of his room occupying the frame, or rather half of the frame being in his room and her crawling across the wall being like, oh my gosh, what? Uh, yeah, oh yeah. yeah. That's that's. I mean... On down to the piano wire. Holy! Oh cow. yes. Well, and then what? Well, and then like there's the naked man grinning in the closet. Like before you see like all of them, there's him like in the closet across the yeah. way. And yep. then right after that, you get and this is what I thought you meant for like the <laughs> other big jump scare. You get freaking Annie in the corner. Yes. Like yes. just running out from the corner. Yes. Uh, and That's then. Terrible. 
And then, of course, yes, I mean, conceptualizing a moment like this, like who does this? She's levitating, point one, she's levitating. Point two, she is methodically sawing off her own head with piano wire or some version of wire. And then on top of that, the look on her face, these bug-eyed, like, frowned, staunch, like, this is what's happening kind of look. Oh, my God. Yeah. <laughs> like, it's, it's awful. It's, it's awful. just terrible. And then after that, you just get more and more naked people, like naked people grinning in the corner. Naked. Pe- I wrote uh, on my little note here, I put uh, grinning naked person in the corner, naked man in the closet, naked people over there. And then I just wrote so many naked people people like just all of yeah. the naked people out of the closet that's all that's just i mean uh, yeah, 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 yeah. you know you're at a new phase of life when it's that's all scary you know what i mean it's, like... <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's true it's true it's like, it's like normally it'd be like oh I want oh to my that. god what? Whoa, no. whoa 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 <laughs> like when that's it i just love the notion of some like real jaded horror person watching hereditary not being scared at all but they're totally not comfortable <laughs> with naked bodies and that's they're like i gotta leave that's <laughs> what pushes the, yeah <laughs> <laughs> like jump out the jump out the window um well i want to uh, here's a question too on the notion sure. but i'm but I'm, I'm i'm maybe answering it in my head here <laughs> um <laughs> heading on up that's so great. <laughs> it's 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 on my notes right here, but that's not where I'm. Well, that topically is where I'm going. That that comment is not where I'm going. I refuse because Aster feels like such a methodical, intentional, conscientious filmmaker. Yeah, I refuse to think that there's much fat present in this film. Right, I agree. But I am in my head as we've been talking and about the scare specifically and then piano wire, like I can't even, I don't even know how to reconcile what that imagery is, but yeah, the nature of headlessness becomes so strangely significant. Yeah, of course. End. Yeah, of course. And now maybe you have a take on that, like a, like a interpretation, but as I'm trying to process like what, what in the world, why is it such a big deal? Mm. It it then does harken back to my question two minutes ago of like Charlie's essence of and who she is like like the cult. My interpretation of the the narrative of the film, the peripheral narrative, is the cult exhumes Grandma, mm-hmm. and while they're out of the home, places her headless body in the attic. Yes, which unfortunately then poor Steve blames on Annie. Mm. Um, yeah, yeah. But one, why is she beheaded? Why does that matter? Two, why is it so significant that Annie beheads herself, however possessed or not she is there at the end? But I I do think Charlie is not just being reared, but maybe actually is of importance even before her death. Like the the weirdo at the funeral who who gives her the creeper smile. Oh like, right. Right. They know right. who she is. They know yeah, absolutely. either yeah. either what she's ultimately being groomed for or what she currently is. Sure. And so is, this is me actually posing the question, not meant to be rhetorical, like is their beheading of grandma and ultimately Annie's beheading of herself as homage to what has happened to the body of Charlie? So what I would say to that is actually I... I don't think it's necessarily homage, like oh, sure, char, you right, know, char, be, because and what makes me think that is because as they're driving to the party, they close up on the telephone pole where that symbol is, and so the 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 little uh, wave symbol right. or as it were from the necklace yeah. is on the telephone pole, and it's not on the telephone pole like after the fact; it's there before, meaning. There is some design for this telephone pole. There's, there is, you know, a, a, a purpose it will play in the scheme of things. So, what my take on it is actually, although the particulars of this religious cult, I would not begin sure. to postulate on. Right. Uh, there is something about the three generations of right. of right. headless beings, as it were, because Charlie's head is upon that statue. 
at the at the end, or at least I think it's Charlie's head. No, is the it statue, not? The statue is just a carved item. No. Is it just a carved? Because it looks because the she reason she removes I thought that, the crown from it. Yeah, but I, the well, reason the I'm sorry to keep cutting you off. The the physical human form of the statue does not have a Charlie head on top. Now maybe I can't remember in the frame is her head elsewhere, but it's not atop the statue. That was what because this time when I watched it, that was what I thought. It's hard to make that everything about that statue out, but most of it is golden in color mm-hmm. and and the head is specifically like a dark gray. And so because the head looked so dramatically different in coloration from the rest of it, I wondered and actively thought like, is that Charlie's head up on top of up on top of this statue? Um, now, again, you, you seem pretty definitive. I haven't done the research to confirm or deny it. It's just something that I picked up on when I was watching it. But I think that instead of it being too, too specific to your question, I don't think that the uh, recurring decapitation motif was in homage to what had happened to Charlie so much as I think the entire design from the beginning, though I, I can't even begin to know why, the entire design from the beginning appears to be that these beings, these three generations, will be headless for this ceremony. And that's, yeah, that's as much as I could could postulate for it. But I do think it was purposeful from the beginning rather than, oh, she died by that method, so we'll mimic that method for this ceremony. Right. But um, I, And where I went with the whole head thing was simply just the, the notion in, in uh, Christian theology of Christ being the head of the church. And so, the, the, like, Joan's final ceremonial speech is really upsetting in a number of ways. It's just got sure. some disturbing yeah, language yeah, yeah. in it and everything like that. But particularly when she outright says we reject the Trinity, that's a, that you know, again, this is a pagan cult, so it fits in line I'm gonna, with what they're I'm doing. Gonna, I am going to intentionally, in order to pat you on the back, credit you here. You're going to think I'm a crazy person. I just pulled up on Amazon Prime where it's streaming. You are right. It is. Oh, oh, okay, great, great, wow, yeah, okay. So, um, so yes, on so, top of the physical weirdo form at the top of the treehouse is the head of Charlie. Is the head of the head? Of, okay, all right, all right, and that's and so in my mind, the connections between because it's also it's very much in a kind of um, I'm going to use this word. Uh, it, it's in a sort of mimicked version of the traditional Christ imagery. We normally see the image of Christ with his hands, with two fingers, and he's holding his palms open, two fingers, thumb out. Usually he's holding it up like a like a prayer symbol, like palm out facing right, right. someone. Right. This one, it's specifically pointed down. Um, then there's the, the head on top with this crown on it. We normally, and there's, it looks a bit like a, if I'm remembering the visual correctly, it looks a bit like a, like a, almost like a halo type thing, uh, which is again, imagery right, yep. that we normally see with Christ. And so in my mind, where I went with the whole sort of they're all headless was simply this connecting point of this is a direct sort of antagonism towards uh, the uh, traditional Christian theological framework and uh, adopting of this payment uh, as their uh, you know saving entity, as it right, were. Right. And so by adopting that... They are deliberately sort of like positioning this other version of the head of this thing being, and of course, literal head, metaphorical head, all of that sort of. Again, I'm I'm stumbling no, my I way mean, through the idea, but that's where that's well, where I went I, with it. I I don't know by any means that I would disagree with anything you've said. I I think that's a helpful sort of way to walk it through. I think I'm a little stuck on, but it doesn't matter ultimately. The because I'm with you, you've reminded me of the the little word carved on the telephone pole, and now mm. I'm just stuck on like, okay, well, okay, wait a minute, you know. Yeah. So, so I, I think I think broadly speaking, we're just meant to take away that there's a lot of ritual to this cult right. that we're just not really meant to be privy to because ultimately it doesn't matter so much. I just thought right. it's so noticeably intentional that the headlessness kind of kind of recurs um yeah. through the film but anyway yeah, yeah. it's this is a jacked up movie yo it is kind of jacked up um i know we've been talking a while um i i will defer if you have i mean obviously there's 
the overt on the nose theme of of grief, which may be you know what we talk about for the next few moments before we wind down. Um, but I uh, there's something that I'm scratching at in connection to this idea of grief. But I want to defer to you first and hear what you had to say, or if you had any sort of specific takeaways, thematically I mean, I, speaking. Yeah, I've got. I don't have fully formed essays like I occasionally do, but I do have several kind of big ideas here. Um, I, well, I don't, my, none of what I've got explicitly deals with grief. Do you want to talk oh. about that? So the notion that I had, which honestly may just be a question that I raise, and I'm, I'm actively saying we don't need to explore it unless it actively pings something. But the notion that I had of what often comes to light when people are grieving a loss is they want some sort of, most of the time, want some sort of reclamation, like I wish I had them back or I wish I had this back or some form of uh, you know reclaiming. It brought me back to, and you, you've seen the film, uh, it brought me back to Vertigo, the idea that when uh, his character in Vertigo, Alfred Hitchcock's Vertigo, has lost... Um, this woman, and then finds another woman that looks similar and then begins to systematically remake her into mm -hmm. what he had before. And that's another conversation. We had a whole episode about it. Go listen to that episode. But um, in in terms of grief, there are ways that I do believe we will try to basically, um, we can want that reclamation so badly that we will often manipulate the circumstances or even the people around us to refashion and reclaim what we've lost. Um, and it, again, it's a psychological habit where we cannot cope with the goodbye. So we have to uh, resurrect it somehow often mm -hmm. in, uh, and this is not just grief as in death. It could be uh, you, you, a relationship in your life ends. And so then the next one, you're constantly trying to sort of navigate it in what you were missing and what you were, you know, had lost before and try to reshape this other person into the image of what you feel like you were missing before. It's just a psychological reality in my mind that we very often will uh, just basically try to make of others what we feel we have lost ourselves. And again, I, it, it's more just something that the film makes me think about than a fully formed bumper sticker thought that I would raise up, but it is Are just... you, can you contextualize a little bit? Are you in the reclamation notion? Are you talking about Annie's desire or passion for trying to reconnect with Charlie? Is that what yes. You're... Yes. Okay. And as, and as she does that plays very much into, because it's not just her who's trying to reclaim Charlie, this entire cult is trying to raise payment. And so I don't, I'm not, you know, equating that they've somehow lost payment along the way, but they're, you know, sort of manipulating these people along the way and, uh, you know, trying to basically I'm connecting the dots of Annie losing uh, Charlie and then in her efforts to uh, reconnect with her in a very tangible way or at least in a, a, a spiritual way, a real way to her. Um, then she plays right into the hands of these people who are trying to raise something else and trying to possess her and trying or not trying to possess her, but trying to manipulate her in this whole possession ritual to bring back their deific uh, entity, you know? Um, so yeah, it's just, well, it, well it's a big I mean, idea. But. Don't, yeah. Not that you were about to do this, but don't dismiss that notion. I want, I want to sort of take the, the workings of that and, and build on that. And, sure. You know, it's interesting. It's it's super interesting the weird ways in which the interconnections, the intersections we can make from aspects that on their surface seem to have no connection whatsoever. So this book, this Richard Rohr book, The Universal Christ, a couple of things. But one, he spends a lot of time talking about expanding the picture of... Mm. Um, I'm, I am interpreting from memory. So, so someone might read this book and be like, that's not exactly what was said. So just bear with me that, that it might be clumsily sort of formed in my mind, but he is very much taking what we have assigned extreme personal, like we've made, 
we've made faith. We've made Jesus our. We've it's you know Johnny Cash, my own personal Jesus, right? Did he? I don't know if he originated that song, but you know, um, no, um, he, that was an old Depeche Mode song okay, that he right. that he covered. Yeah, but that's what we've done in in mm. in culture in church. Um, it is it we we have interpreted or 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 gosh, there's a lot happening in my brain right now, and I'm trying to to because it's all applicable, and I'm, I want it to be clear and coherent. Sure, sure. The the movie will fool you the way we have fooled ourselves into thinking mm. we are independent agents operating only in response to the immediacy of what is in front of us. Mm. It is only when you expand the aperture and realize you are not independent whatsoever. You are buffeted by forces, external forces. The first time I saw this movie, this is going to be a weird statement. I got disappointed at the end because I was like, dude, this convention of the dolls is so interesting. Like they, they just oh, leave that. They leave wow. that by the wayside. But that's what this is. That's all the movie is. It's yes, you are yes. a thing being played with, but you don't know it. Right. And where yes. I'm trying to connect this universal Christ idea, and I'm going to get to some even bigger notions here in a second, is he is attacking that notion that that all we are is a result of the immediacy of our lives. Whereas mm. he's saying no. And in fact, this is this is going to knock your socks off. Uh oh. He he talks about these things are coming to me now. They weren't coming to me at the end of watching this movie. He identifies sin. How he defines it in this book is as rejection. Mm. And what is so traumatizing and dreadful and sad and tragic to me about this movie is it ends in complete rejection of all the relationships that existed in it. There's nothing yeah, yeah. remaining connecting these people in healthy, whole, loving ways. Mm. Yeah. And I think that the notion, of, even the title, like I was processing that, I'm like, okay, it's not just a lineage thing. The power of the, the dinner scene, she yells, nobody admits anything they've done. Mm. But, you know, that's Annie accusing Peter. Peter then returns the favor and says, well, why was Charlie at the party to begin with? We all right. overlook, right. we all overlook our own complicity in the suffering of others. Right. And that gets handed to us. It's hereditary. It is human life. We get handed the suffering in, uh, enacted by others down to us. We receive it as our own denting and wounding, thinking, well, this is just my relational dynamic to this person. This is just my relational dynamic in this scenario. Not really right. broadening our spirit to realize this is a this this is a totality. This is not an isolated thing. Right. And right. and continuing this notion of sin as rejection, what is the verbiage that Joni uses yep. in summoning payment? I wrote it down as you were as you were talking, because I wanted to come back to it and here you are at it. Yes, we reject the Trinity, which Re go ahead. Yeah. No, I'm just I'm, I'm that's really galvanizing me in this moment of like what is so dreadful about this movie is these people think it's their own pain that's wounding them. Mm. The, not and and dude, my god, we do this to ourselves and to each other. They if I mean it's us as viewers. This my estimation of this movie is really growing right now. Like mm. we watch this movie and think we are observing the interdynamics of a family tragedy. And we are utterly, unless you just know it or are super keen, we're utterly blind to, right. to the externality of what is actually preying upon them. And I think a broader takeaway here has to do with this notion of you can't, it's difficult. It's, it's massively difficult. Like it's it blows my mind. Think about Annie recounting this story in this group. Script writing wise, filmmaking wise, it's exposition. Like yeah. but she is rattling it off as just like matter of fact. She herself mm. is utterly oblivious. You can as a viewer, 
as a as a student of film, you can watch that moment and track the entire story being told to you. Yeah. Her as a character thinks this is just my lot. Mm. Right. Does that is it making sense at all what I'm trying it's it's really difficult to kind of Yes. Uh it all defog yeah, it, the glass here, but No, it all it all makes sense to me. I do think it's a massive idea finding Yes. You know, a a singular sort of um summation of it would be challenging. But I do think I mean, I, I, to to go back to what you said, the, the connecting point that you are making about Rohr's observation about sin as rejection, and then Joni uses the uh, Joni Joan uses the language uh, of you know we reject the Trinity, and in Christian theology, the Trinity most directly represents relationship, mm, and that's yes, what you brother. said. It most directly relate relates the relationship of the divine to itself and the extension of that relationship to humanity. And, uh, you know, I'm not about to unpack the entire Trinity theology here, but that is that is sort of an entry point into that. It, it is it is a rejection uh, when she says we, she rejects the Trinity. That's a through line, a mirror of they have also rejected the previously existing relationships at play in these people. And now the only relationship at play in the final moment of the film is of master to servant. They have uh, basically raised sort of a master. And it is interesting to me, a lot of what you're saying and what you're scratching at, the ways in which we ourselves um, can merely just be basically pawns to forces we're not privy to. Well, um, and like the, the this this line of hers nobody nobody admits anything they've done you know i'm thinking about our quarterly king conversation and and i want to rephrase this sentence which is utterly div- divorced from the context of the film but what nobody understands the story they're in mm, like she yeah. is not ignore the grief uh, but just purely on a mechanical level she is not comprehending the narrative playing out that she is being used in. Right. Yes. And it's interesting. I don't want to pull this into this conversation too heavily right now, but two weeks from now we'll be discussing the endless. And what's really beautiful about that movie is it's a movie all about the, the need to connect Mm, and, and the, the division that has to be overcome in order to connect. This movie is about what happens when we don't. Maybe not even not what happens when we can't. What happens when we just don't? We Right. You right. know, P- Peter is standing outside his home where he has inadvertently murdered his sister. Right. And and right. looking in with unimaginable wells of grief that he doesn't know how to express while his mother who even in dream state admits trying to disconnect him at birth pre-birth yeah, yeah. is staring at him from a car that she then drives off. Like these characters mm. have, have, if they ever had it and, and you could make a case that the, the actions of the cult, which we should apply metaphorically in terms of just the broader nature of forces beyond our comprehension right. are, are right. at work keeping them from connecting to each other, from yeah. comprehending yeah. The, the dynamism of a relationship that can be had because as Rohr puts it, rejection is sin. And that doesn't mean you actively participate. It means there is a force that wants you disconnected. Yes. Yes. You know, Hey buddy. Hi. Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. And I do think there is, I think we've, we've said on the show before, just in observations of sort of the malignant nature of what we would deem powers and principalities, uh, that so much of what it wants um, is that disconnection and is isolation and is, you know, to basically confine you off in a space where it can basically pick you off and feed off of you. And I, I think the only way to really combat that in in any sort of uh, healthy or wholesome way would be to to <laughs> reject 
I don't want to say reject rejection because that just sounds silly, sure. but like to reject disconnection, maybe to like, no, I'm, I'm rejecting the tendency I have to either isolate myself, to carry around these private pains, to, uh, to even view my own verdicts of a situation in isolation or without pushback, without challenge, to basically just uh, hide myself into myself. Um, and well, and to, to not to I know you're attempting this to but to not use the word we're actively trying to set aside. But I would even maybe articulate that as embrace interdependence like mm, right, you, right. you you are like just this conversation. The, the, the title of this film is, is just screaming at me of the unconscious ways we hand down our own rejection of ourselves rejection of others you know like like it is hereditary it is i am not a oh it's just original sin we're so depraved we're you're bound for hell if not but but i am a fan i am a a person who thinks there are things we are not aware that we inadvertently hand generationally down to the next yes i agree yes and life life of faith life life in relationship to this as Roy would say, universal Christ is about the constant conscious unburdening of yourself so that you are then not burdening those you might hand that burden down to. I don't know. Yeah. A well, there's a, I don't have the scripture pulled up in front of me, but there is a uh, script read. I know I'm, I'm, just, I'm letting everybody down. Um, but the, there is scriptural precedent for that. Like sin is handed down by generation, but also it's scriptural precedent that, uh, grace and and goodness is handed down exponentially more wow. uh, generation to generation, and that um, you know that that a generation that chooses actively to embrace uh, again in scriptural context the mandates of the Lord that that there are ways to break off the sort of uh, we'll call them as a quick through line here the sort of bad gene stuff that has been handed down, and I'm talking we're of course talking about lots of you know, metaphorical things, right, not just right. like, you know, standard DNA. Hopefully our listeners are savvy enough to pick up on that, but that there are ways that you can break free from the patterns and habits. The ones, and, uh, this is, this is a low key. Congratulations to our audience. The ones not smart enough to pick up some of that stuff left us a long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> that, is a, that is a fair point. Yes, that's true. That's true. Um, but yeah, that uh, you can break free from the shackles of, uh, well, this is what's always been handed down to me. But I do think there needs to be an honesty of this is what I'm up against. And this is what this is sort of the pattern in my, uh, you know, in my lineage, as it were. And we have to come to terms with that as individuals. We have to come to terms with that within our own family units. We have to come to terms with that as a community, as a nation, like all of those things. We have to acknowledge like these are the things that have been handed down to us. And it is a naivete to say, well, I am not that, but it is also, uh, I think, too defeatist to say, well, because I come from that, there's no hope for me That's to all do I'll anything ever different. Be. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Um, that we are so much more than that, and that we have active choices to do different things to hand down to our uh, future generations something different than what was handed to us. And I think that's a consideration we must, like you said, embrace, and, and we have to be actively aware of it uh in ourselves and in our in our personhood um yeah (laughs) that is that is a lot um i i don't know if you had more to say on that i'm I'm, I'm really i'm really thrilled with what the the conversation this particular thing this particular film has sparked uh you want to head to the fog meter and and see where this all shakes up as it were um let's do it so the fog meter is our very specific metric, how we rate the film on its fear and its God meter, as it were, its uh, scares and its substance, if you will. Um, so Ari Aster's Hereditary. Uh, I'll go first on the fear measurement and uh, give this a uh, a really unqualified 10. This is a scary, scary movie. It is disturbing, upsetting, scary, all of it. I'm going to give it a 10. Yeah. I am gonna, <laughs> I'm gonna chop my head off right along there with you, buddy. It's yeah, it's a ten. It's, it's scary as crap. 
It is so, so terrifying. Uh, what would you give it for the for the God factor, for its general substance? Hmm. I think the more I ponder these thoughts, they're, they're not of my own making. Like, this movie is a right. rich, rich, layered text. Yeah, they're in there, yeah. I'm... I am going to go with a qualified nine. That qualification, okay. that qualification being, I'm curious to know. Screw it. I'm gonna go with a ten. What I was gonna say. All right. What I was gonna say is, I'm curious. I'll, I'll package it this way: watching Hereditary initially, and then Midsommar before my second hereditary viewing, it's easy to walk away from both of those and be like, this dude hates religion. Like, mm, like it's mm, very anta yeah. antagonistic towards it and maybe even Christianity. But then I listened to an interview with him about Midsommar and I was like, well, that's, that's not really what I thought this was about at all. Um, right, right. Just kind of using certain trappings to, to examine a certain thing. And so I don't know that I agree with that initial assessment I made to begin with. And so sure where sure. I was going to qualify is I just don't know exactly what to take away from the, the, the end end, except this boulder rolling down a hill towards ultimate splinter and rejection of all things mm. is mm -hmm. maybe the point. Like anyway, so yeah, I, yeah. I mean, it, yeah, there's a lot going on there. So I'm going to, I'm going to go with the 10 man. All right. Myself. No, no, very, very bold. I'm going to hedge slightly uh, simply because I think I need to digest some of this more and I have to give the measurement now. Uh, I am <laughs> going to go with the nine that you yeah. were about to. Um, I, I do think there's so much going on in the film. And I think, uh, I don't know how many times I'll revisit it just because of its heaviness. Right. But I think were I to revisit this multiple times throughout the coming years, um, I think I'm going to find more and more at work in it. I mean, Tony Collette endorsed, like, this director was prepared. Nothing is accidental. He knew what he wanted. He executed it to the best of his ability, which I think was exceptional craft. Um, so, yeah, I'm going to go uh, with a nine, which means, good Lord. I know. I'm, I can't believe it. A 9.75, or might as well just round it up to a straight 10, of uh, four hereditary on the fog meter this is uh Listener, listeners may think otherwise but you and i after both of our second viewings gave very tentative like huh i may have i need to reassess this i don't know like i would yes, not have given yes. this two two tens right after yeah. the second viewing no absolutely absolutely and uh and so yeah if you if you watched it already and you're like what are you kidding like 9.75 uh, I would encourage a secondary viewing. Uh, I think there's a lot more to it once you know the conceit that uh, gets your brain and your spirit going in a couple of different places that maybe didn't exist there before. Um, so with that having been said, would you, Nathan, recommend Hereditary? It's <laughs> um, a complicated question. It is. <laughs> well, no, it's a straightforward question with a complicated answer. Um Sure. I was ready to absolutely not recommend. Um, okay. I, I think it's an extremely cautious recommendation. Like it is not, this is a movie for the thinking horror fan. Like to me, okay. like you, you have to kind of have your brain on to engage on a certain level, what it's after. And it's just a really well-crafted film, but also it is not for the casual. Like I, I just want to jump scare kind of movie. Cause it's yep. not yep. that. Yep. So, no. so it, it is a cautious, but yeah, I, I would recommend it. I, uh, I think I had mentioned this to you before we spoke here. Uh, I give it a wholehearted recommendation for a very specific audience. <laughs> it is not for the faint of heart. As you said, it's not for the casual horror fan. Um, uh, but I think if you are interested in horror that is challenging and that is, uh, is going to make you think is going to make you feel things you might feel a little uncomfortable feeling and thinking about. Um, but I think ultimately rewarding to reflect on these kinds of things, then I have given a wholehearted recommendation, but it is not for the faint of heart. Um, it is very disturbing. It is fully committed and it, it embraces what it is going for. Um, it pulls no punch. And so I think, uh, yeah, it spares uh, yeah. no head. No, it spares no head. No, not <laughs> not at all. Reed, um, welcome back, so buddy. There, welcome back. Every, welcome Third back. Third anniversary. Nathan. Wow. 
third anniversary. Here comes Hereditary. And uh, and dude, wow. come on, you know this. Like we we were almost lukewarm going into this conversation about this. We movie. were, we were, we we led with it because we thought it would be the one that we would just sort of like push the button for. <laughs> <laughs> yep. and, and here so, we are. So what? Yeah. remind us what we're doing next week. So next week we are going to be talking about Alex Garland's film, uh, not nearly as widely seen as Hereditary, but, um, uh, but pretty highly praised from what I can assess. Uh, Alex Garland's film, Annihilation, starring Natalie Portman. Uh, <laughs> listeners won't know, but we might get into this next time. This is actually take oh, two for us. They'll know. <laughs> I mean, they'll but, know once we talk about it. Sure. But uh but yeah, so check out Alex Garland's Annihilation. Hereditary was we weren't able to give you a preview of this in the on writing conversation, but Hereditary is available to stream on Amazon Prime right now, or if you have a Canopy account, uh, a- Annihilation is available to stream uh, as of this recording on Amazon Prime as well, um, mm-hmm. if you have that, and available through all of the rest of the uh, the outlets. So um, at any rate, uh, check that out. And Nathan, thank Great. you so much for welcome, uh, for clucking your tongue along with me for these couple of hours to and have this conversation. Let us together embrace interdependence. And with, and with that... We'll see you guys next week. <laughs> Bye. The Fear of God is the beginning of wisdom, but not the end of the conversation. And you can continue the conversation in a variety of ways. You can follow us on Twitter, at The Fear of God. You can like and follow us on Facebook, or join the Facebook Fear of God discussion group. You can follow us on Instagram, at Fear of God Podcast, or go to morethanonelesson.com to leave a comment on this post or any of the other official episode posts. Email us at fearofgodpodcast at gmail.com. Our theme music was composed by Lee Wright and Reed Lackey, and our podcast art was crafted by Jacob Hunt of jacobhuntcomics.com. Merchandise for the show can now be found at tpublic.com. Just search for The Fear of God Podcast, all one word. And last but not least, if you listen to us through iTunes, we would greatly appreciate a rating or a review. Thank you for listening. We'll see you next week. I mean, I want to alert a winner, and we'll figure out who the winner is. I think we have a little... A little guest. Yes. To to help us determine a winner. As a matter of fact, yes. Okay, one minute. Reed, it's you. <laughs> Not quite. I said a little guess. It was, it was a little guy joke. I got the joke. <laughs>